Hello and welcome to episode 21 of Subplot of Course, a podcast discussing a new science fiction literary work on the second Tuesday of every month. I'm Stavros, and with me is someone who isn't nearly as effective as, at improving the minds of people around him as alien monoliths, but he tries anyway. Charlie. Say hi, Charlie. Oh, I try. He tries. I try. Charlie's a math teacher. Uh, also with me is Vincent, who is looking into the health effects of having our nuclear devices detonated by space babies. Say hello, Vincent. Uh, I'm still wondering whether or not the nuclear devices were aimed at the space baby in defense of the Earth. I'm sure we'll talk about that later. I'm um, Vincent's an epidemiologist. Um, and finally, we're also joined for the first time by guest host Adrian, who actually has some incredibly intelligent and insightful talking points on literature that we're definitely not going to be using today. <laughs> Say hello. Hey, um, I taught a course on science fiction. This is the one book that I missed on in that class. So, right. <laughs> You're already an Wait. expert. Wait, Severus, you invited people who actually know how to read books and actually talk about them? I know, right? Don't call him Adrian, he's Dr. Adrian. <laughs> yes, and speaking of Adrian, he is an English literature PhD candidate and teacher. Um, and today we're going to be talking about 2001 A Space Odyssey, written by Arthur C. Clarke and published in 1968. And of course, you should be prepared for spoilers. Um, so the first portion of the novel takes place three million years ago. Proto humans. <laughs> have no concept of hunting or tools and are under constant threat of dehydration, starving, and being killed by wildlife or an opposing tribe. One day... <laughs> yeah, exactly like that. Um, and one day, a monkey man named Moonwasher encounters a large crystalline monolith, which ends up evaluating his tribe and program programming them with the sparks of higher intelligence, setting the stage uh, for humanity's evolution. Stavros, it is yes. an ape man. We did not evolve from monkeys. Yeah, At least that's what I vaguely remember from high school <laughs> biology, maybe. Yay! Uh, fast forward a few million years to 2001. The second portion of the novel is set in the future. Obviously, this is published in 68, so 2001 was the future. Uh, Dr. Haywood Floyd takes a trip from Earth to an orbiting space station to the moon, where the, which the U.S., Soviet Russia, and China have started to colonize. Once there, he mm -hmm. visits TMA-1, a recently excavated black monolith discovered by a recent electromagnetic sweep of the lunar surface. When the monolith is exposed to its first lunar light, it emits a blast of radio energy deep out into the solar system. Fast forward a few months, and we're at the third distinct part of the novel. Um, the spacecraft Discovery 1 heads towards an extraterrestrial anomaly in orbit of Saturn. David Bowman hangs out with his colleague Frank and the famous HAL 9000 computer on board. Unfortunately, HAL makes a mistake about an equipment fault, and once the humans discover his error, tries to murder them so he can carry out the mission which he's had to keep a secret from them. Makes total sense. Uh, sure. Bowman is the lone survivor, and after disconnecting Hal, arrives at the gigantic monolith and takes a space pod to attempt to land on it. The monolith ends up being a gateway that brings Bowman across the galaxy slash galaxies to some kind of hub planet whose inhabitants have long since evolved out of their physical forms. Automated systems are still active, however, and after a brief welcome, literally unspool him and transition him into an energy being space baby. Again, makes total sense. Uh, he then rockets back to Earth, and the novel ends with him contemplating what to do with the planet after nullifying Earth's nuclear defenses. So first, it's, it's, it's difficult not to talk about this book in relation to the movie, um, only because they were literally uh, the, the book at was the same time. Written, the book was written to write the movie, essentially, right? Like, he was hired to write the movie, and Cooper told him, no, go write a book, that'll be more interesting than having you write a script. Isn't that how it worked? I, I forget. much, yes. So, uh, so we've all watched the movie again recently. Um, there's definitely a lot to digest there with uh, what what the hell is going on in a large portion of it. Um, so I'm just going to open it up. Which is better, the book or the movie? Uh, I mean, which one has lots of negative photos of the Grand Canyon for 20 minutes? <laughs> I mean, you can't argue with the types of uh, imagery used late in the book, but... I know, Adrian, you're, you're the guest here. What do you think? We're going to put you on the spot first. Yeah, it's it's kind of cool that, you know, the movie can do a lot of the 
visual sublime, but like it can sort of overwhelm you more and give you a sense of grandeur that way, right? Those first images of space with the, you know, the, that beautiful sort of string quartet music going on is kind of amazing. Um, but I don't know, the, the book sort of feels like a much more complete experience. Like normally I'm a big fan of sort of surrealist moments in movies, but um, after wa reading the book, like the movie kind of feels a little incomplete. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, personally, I, I I liked overall the novel a little bit better only because it explains the crazy craziness <laughs> happening towards the end of the book. Um, but I mean, it, it, I can totally see someone saying like they, they like the kind of more artistic rendering of what's happening. I can totally buy that. Uh, I do think the movie does a, a better job of making HAL 9000 like a better villain. Yeah. Uh, even though he's yeah. just a small part of both the movie and the book. But I know what do you what do you guys think? The one thing I liked a lot in the book is just how much it actually explains about, like, space travel. Like, I know the movie tries to give you a good sense of, like, isolation and stuff like that. But for the, like, the book gives you numbers and, like, exactly how much time passes and exactly how far apart things are and exactly how pre precise all these machines are. It gives you this kind of overwhelming sense of how intimidating space is and how just absolutely incredible all the technology used to traverse it is i mean they even go to the bother of you know explain how a wrench works in zero g right like there's so much explanation yeah. of the technology in this book and toilets yeah Who forgets the like mission critical like page long if i if you guys oh. notice when watching the film I there's have... this there's a scene where like floyd is like looking <laughs> at the space toilet and it's like this like itemized list of instructions and it's just like did, a did you... long thing but he's just like huh <laughs> Hmm. I was gonna say, did you pause it and see if it's the same thing as the book? Or... <laughs> I, I yeah. I, did anyone? I don't think so. I, no, I <laughs> meant to, but I never bothered to. <laughs> I think that the movie is kind of incomplete without the book because you know the whole seed of intelligence in the monkeys. It's hard to tell that they have any seed of intelligence planted yeah. in them. So the book yeah. really feels like almost like prerequisite reading before you watch a movie. But the movie is so epic with the soundtrack. It's like, I haven't heard a good soundtrack like that since like, you know, some of the Star Wars movies and stuff like that with John Williams. Like the opening music is so iconic. You, it's like Darth Vader's theme. You can tell it's 2001 Space Odyssey when you hear that <laughs> music. Yeah. I mean, that music terrified Star Wars' dog while I was watching it with them. <laughs> Especially the 20 minutes of, with all the lights, your dog was like, no! <laughs> And there's also the, you know, while Hal's getting disconnected, like the 20 minutes of David Bowman breathing into the mic. Yeah. You don't get that in the book. That's what I'm talking about. Like the whole like Hal 9000 oh, yeah. and everything uh, was way better in the film. Just because you can hear him just like breathing as he makes Hal's brain turn off. But yeah, I think there's definitely something to be said about the book that, and it, 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 you know, I feel like the, you know, the literal explanation of what happens at the end gives it something more that you can bite into there. Yeah. And the movies, like, like for a lot of the space imagery, you're like, okay, you can see how ten years later, Star Wars is such a major improvement over it. But for st like some of the stuff where, yeah, sometimes it's hilarious where it's like, well, they obviously have rotating sets. But other times, like the the whole airlock sequence where he, you know, in the movie he blasts himself out of the little pod. Right. I was just, you know, I was one. I was like, that's pretty convincing. I wasn't sure exactly how they did it. I'm sure it's obvious once you know, but. <laughs> Yeah, I think the yeah the uh, the movie had the blasting himself in the airlock, whereas the book had the how decompresses the ship, right? Which was also pretty epic. But yes. I don't think there's there's something to be had on both. Like I don't think one is clearly better than the other. Does I, does anyone have a strong opinion that one is definitely better than the other? Like if you had to only pick one, I think they're both great in their own way and what they provide. Whether it's the like artistic vision of the movies or like the very specific, well thought out and planned themes of the book and emphasis and specifics and details i was gonna say it's just hard to say given the fact that the movie is so much at the forefront of you know our our sense of of that that era and of science fiction in general right i mean yeah. um it's hard to even sort of put the book up there um against it right sure yeah it's definitely like an iconic pop culture phenomenon the movie is mm -hmm. whereas the book is mm -hmm. kind of like nerds <laughs> so the one thing the book did is if last year we read contact and the book is like oh i feel like this is almost like a more effective version of contact mm -hmm. however right. like you know 
two decades earlier. I forget exactly when Contact was written. Was Contact so, meets the Martian because some guy has to science the shit out of space. <laughs> yeah, Bowman does some uh, some some of that Martian science. Work. Yeah, In space. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. So I think it's I think it's a wash as far as which one's better. But I mean, speaking of the timeline of the uh, of the book and movie development, I mean, they both came out in '68, which is pre Moon Landing. Um, compare this movie to like Star Trek, the original series, which was on screen at the same time. I mean, what a friggin' difference! Um, I feel like it's <laughs> as far as like the prediction. I, it is before the Moon Landing. The Moon Landing was the, fo- the subsequent year, so all of that stuff on the Moon, no one had actually <sighs> seen anything like that. So. Um, as far as like future prediction and um, uh, accuracy of stuff on the moon, I feel like I did a pretty good job. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on you know for sixty eight like how, you know does this come off as a you know just like just another science fiction um, you know piece of uh, piece of media or is it a kind of ahead of its time? I don't know. I have to communicate on a phaser and transporter. <laughs> I can start to. <laughs> As I warned several earlier, like I know plenty about physics, but as my advisor is very sad to find out, I know very little about astronomy and like the moons and stuff like that. But from what like vaguely I can remember about like moons of Saturn and Jupiter, I was like, all oh, this sounds vaguely familiar. Like I'd be really interested in like checking out the descriptions of like Titan and Europa compared to how they actually look and how they're actually described now that we've actually sent probes out to check them out. Yeah, it's kind of funny how they mention how like we're finding moons and around Jupiter and Saturn like all the time, right? Which was true at that moment and has since like slowed <laughs> down, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because like the I know that they were saying in the little forward to the book that if they in the movie they changed the planet from Saturn to Jupiter, which actually cuts down a bunch of travel time. Yeah, <laughs> and it's cool because apparently the book predicted slingshotting satellites using Jupiter's gravity to get it further out of the solar system faster like i thought that was cool but i'm not sure like if the descriptions of the rings of saturn are totally off because i heard if they had used it in the movie it's like it would have been hilariously outdated i think we the reason why they used jupiter in the film was because they just couldn't find a image of saturn that looked believable (laughs) yeah and plus it's like jupiter is way more striking visually yeah like if you ignore the rings (laughs) like in the book it makes for a great verbal that's I was like, true. if you're going to... No, I, I mean, in terms of, like, the clouds and stuff like that, the colors and everything. Sure. Like, it, Forget about the rings. Yeah. <laughs> the future imaginary of, like, the, the geopolitics of the time is really kind of interesting, right? Because, like, 68 is one of the most, like, devastating years in for, like, the West, right? In terms of these great student revolts that were happening, um, there's a lot of concern over, like, you know, whether or not democracy is going to survive in 68. And you have this, like, grand sort of utopian vision where, you know, the USSR and the Russia and Americans have gotten together. I guess China is still possibly becoming a little bit too warlike. <laughs> China's around, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but there's that weird slight where it's like, you know, some people have not figured out that, like, exploration is more exciting than warfare um, so, and then for them so one of my go and do the, like the space station right where there's like a howard johnson and a hilton right and the, the <laughs> these russian delegates and um what's his name the uh the, the american advisor right talking like, very happily to each other yeah right yeah like that mm-hmm. that, that sense of utopianism right that that belief that we would be able to work things out to that extent that's true well, one thing I do want to bring up is the prediction of you know computer technology at the time <laughs> um you know, Hal, Hal is a, as the extreme example, because <clears throat> they do show a lot of how space flight works and stuff like that, which I think, aside from the special effects in the movie being pretty good, like the description of how it worked in the book even, like it goes into a lot of detail and all of it seems super believable to some guy who doesn't know anything about, you know, how space travel could or should work. Uh, but it like totally sold me on that. It seems like very forward thinking. And even the computers itself, like developing the AI consciousness, that doesn't seem that far away either. I mean, the wild thing, though, is that sense, that, that repeated sense that, like, if if something can go wrong with a human, it can go wrong with an AI in this book. Kind yeah. of, like, blew yeah. my mind. Yeah. Thought, like, <laughs> no, of course this is an erotic computer. Like, what else would you yeah. expect when you tell <laughs> I mean, somebody can't tell people? Yeah. I, I'm sure we'll have computer brains by the time we get to 2001. Like, that seems pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that totally happened. The future! <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, right, I think well, that most of the uh, sci-fi that we read that actually wins a war tends to be pretty spot on in terms of the prediction. Whereas I think a lot of the sci-fi that isn't really spot on, they just don't win the Hugos and Nebula. Just trash sci-fi. 
I'm gonna read that trash. Wow! <laughs> why, why, is it, why is it Master Chief like killing aliens nowadays? <laughs> well, anyway, so let, let's move on. So <clears throat> one of the, one of the big <laughs> things of, of this novel um, is the alien intervention component. So as much as we like talking about how <clears throat> the the overall plot of this novel is, you know, in in all three components: the Moonwatcher component, the Taylor Flay component, and the Bowman component are all like alien intervention via the monoliths um, to play with us, basically. So, Adrian, one of the things we talked about before uh, we recorded was you're you're feeling like there's a lot of technological c- connection to actual weaponry. Um, so, in the in the way that Moonwatcher, he the first thing he does is beat people to death with stones with uh, bones, basically, right? Um, and Bowman, as he gets transitioned, the, one of the first things he does is blow up nuclear <laughs> weapons. How do you feel about this, like? The aliens, like, even though they're evolving us, they're just turning, it's all weapon-focused. Yeah, I mean, so the the first uh, part of the book and the last part of the book, they have a parallel, right? Because they both end with someone saying, like, and he will think of something, right? And it's kind of important that Moonwatcher's section ends with him killing the others, right? It doesn't end with, like, the moment when humanity has evolved is not when they're able to go and eat meat. It's not when they're able to make tools. It's when they use those tools to kill other man-apes, right? That's sure. the kind of iconic moment there. And then Bowman too, right? His moment as like the star child is when he detonates an ICBM apparently um, for no clear reason, right? Um, I mean, it's kind of a cheat because we know that there are novels after this, right, that clarify some of these issues here. But I mean, that kind of paints a sort of dire sense of what it means to evolve, right? Is to evolve just to be able to kill other beings? Like, is that the sign that you have evolved or not, right? That's not, that's really depressing if it is. Yeah, that's true. Do you guys want to weigh in on this? Like, it's how are these things? Really- I don't know, maybe. I guess it's a question of maybe is the is it like the ends justify the means? Is like the the purpose of evolution the power? Or is the purpose of evolution the a power to get yourself a blank slate and then make reality work? Right. So it's like if someone's painted on the canvas already, and you're like, um, it's like a little kid just painted on the canvas. Let me just paint it white again, and I'll make it into something beautiful. It's like, well, maybe I do need to use force in order to wipe the canvas clean and then make something awesome because kind of hard to build a nice building on top of a crappy foundation that someone someone already built. So I don't know. I guess it's a question of are we focusing on technology as the end or are we talking about the next step of the star baby or whatever as the end, like, or the next step of the moon watcher is to maybe build a space station. Is that maybe the space station is the end that he was envisioning or is it the bone hitting the other monkey? Don't know. Yeah. I, I personally, I didn't see the, the weapon connection at first, although I can totally see that how it could be. I mean, obviously he needed to murder people in order to, it was like a survival thing to me. Like he needs to, beat up animals to eat, make food and ensure survival, like his tribe's like uh, possession of the water source and stuff like that. That's what confused me though. Like, I'm not entirely sure he had to kill any of the others, right? Like, cause <laughs> there's, true. there's harmless there. And that's what the book makes a big point out there. There's standing on two sides of this water canal, just like screaming at each other, but not doing anything. So there's right. no particular reason why he has to go over there and beat the brains out of the guy who is leading them, right? Um, and that, that just sort of confused me. Like, I, I understand why it may not sort of be apparent because it's not like, it doesn't feel like a fully fleshed out thought in the novel. Yeah, I, yeah, I could see it be like some kind of like a, he he maybe wanted to do, go somewhere with that, but then didn't really end up going anywhere. Although, let me focus for a second. The end of the book of the novel where he just arrives at Earth, and then, like, Earth... You could just imagine some guy in Mission Control and Earth just being like, what the fucking yeah. hell is that? Launch everything we have! And then, like, he's just like, no. And then he just, like... It's totally different from the end of the movie, by the way, if, if, if anybody's <laughs> listening that hasn't read... It feels read like it. Kings of Power 3000% or something like that just happened. Like, <laughs> in the novel. Yeah, he's just like, what should I do with my new toy? Hmm... I'm, I'm, I'm so concerned because it says they become radiation beings, right? Yeah, yep. they're like yeah, made of energy, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Light doesn't experience time or a dimension of space, so I'm like, do these beings experience time? And now I just have physics questions that probably don't need to be expanded on. <laughs> Feeble monkey brain, don't try think about these. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie, this is why you're here. Tell us about these physics problems. Special Relativity says if you're moving the speed of light that you've contracted time so that all times happen at once and it contracts all space in the perpendicular direction that you're traveling into into a single... So it contracts that dimension to zero. So essentially light like, is created and hits its endpoint at the same time in its own reference frame. So if you were a light being, like, would you just exist for a moment for all of the universe? 
Or, I don't know. I mean, remember I the book know. uses favorite kind of escape valve of the sci-fi novels when they say, like, you know, oh, of course the monolith had to be 1 by 4 by 9 and that isn't even taking into account other dimensions, right? That these beings <laughs> have ascended into other dimensions of existence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, later on it says, like, and then I could see the monolith was, like, 1 by 4 by 9 by 16 by 25. By... Yeah. <laughs> Adrian, also I was thinking, is there any kind of language connection between Bowman and Moonwatcher? I was thinking about it, and then I realized I was too lazy and didn't care to figure it out. I mean, insofar <laughs> as, like, you know, Bow is, like, the, you know, a weapon right of range right and moonlight yes. apollo and artemis maybe hey that's what i was thinking yay i feel <laughs> i feel validated yeah then what happens to poor frank pool man he doesn't fit in that in that, that man is he, orbiting he, saturn he's the forever. hey frank i was gonna say he was, was the first to man, man to saturn that was the title of that chapter and yeah. it ended with that comment you know he pops up in the last of these books right oh uh, yeah i heard about that as, as, as a human popsicle <laughs> <laughs> the fact that the, that the subsequent uh, novels in the series follow the movie and not the books, I think we don't have to talk about those, <laughs> yeah, just to make that. things easier for ourselves. Wait, so what's really <laughs> different in the movie than the books that the novels actually refer to? Because it seems like vaguely the same stuff happens. Like, what's the specific that would make it different besides the fact that in the books he unravels back to his childhood, whereas in the movie he either just gets older or un unravels through old age? There's no nukes in the movie. Yeah, there's you just no, have the space like, in space, so you don't really realize if. Well, yeah, like nuke. the movie cuts off two seconds before the book does. Problem solved. <laughs> or just, just there are no nu nukes. Is that what happens? It's a pretty, it's a pretty big no thing, nukes. right? Like yeah. the, the movie's are... super open ended because, like, you don't know if Space Baby's real or if like Space Baby's right. hallucination or if he went back yeah. in time or if he's in the future or if he's hostile. Was it playing that epic music when both the monkeys and the star showed up? <laughs> So it could be circular, like the, the the space baby put down the monolith for the monkey because he went back in time. Like you just don't know what's going on. In the <laughs> That's one gripe about the movie. It's awesome because there's so much music, but there's almost no dialogue for a lot of the movie, which is super artistic, oh, yeah. but also explains reading. nothing. I really like watching the movie after reading the book mm -hmm. because it's no longer just impressions; it's like reinforcing specifics with impressions. Yeah, that is a good one. Oh man, okay, yeah, there's a lot to talk about, man. I'm gonna, but I'm gonna speed us along, so. Uh, Hal 9000, as a character, as a conflict in this book slash movie, um, he's he's really famous and stuff like that, but um, I'm definitely feeling after reading the book and watching the movie again, uh, he's emphasized in the movie, of course, but he's like kind of like a side character. Like, why is he in this? Yeah. He's, like, the main thing is, like, al or freaking aliens, like the guy from the meme, aliens, and uh, how they're doing a role in our evolution and stuff like that. But then we have Hal, who is awesome. But he's just kind of like just murdering people and like why is he here? Like he has this this like human connection or this human like mental breakdown, but it's not really relevant to the main plot. Like why did why is he in this besides was Kubrick just like and Arthur C. Clarke are just like, you know what? This is a really awesome idea. We're just gonna shove it in there and make it work. No. There can be only one. <laughs> he is literally the incarnation of Highlander. It's like there are too many protagonists. We would have five space babies and they might fight each other and no, we can only have one space baby. How? <laughs> Choose one. So there so so someone was like, Man, it's not believable that there would only be one guy on this ship. We can only have one. Better make a crazy computer that kills them all. Yay! <laughs> I mean it definitely feels like a kind of um like some unallowance for the movie, right? Because if there's supposed to be this grand parallel between the Moonwatcher sequence in the first part and the Bowman sequence at the end, I don't know where Hal fits into that Moonwatcher sequence, right? I don't know what he's supposed to parallel or what he's supposed to be um, indicative of, right? There isn't anything clearly that resembles him, except maybe, I don't know, the other, the, the one that gets killed. Yeah, it would have been awesome if me. Hal actually won and Hal was Moonwalker. Like, he actually pulled up, <laughs> right? like, I'm going to execute the grand mission. I'm going to go and I'm going to evolve to become space baby computer. The, the, the book almost... The book, <laughs> oh, God. Because uh, the, the book says that they go for, like, the other aliens went from biological to machine to radiation beings, right? Like, it almost implies that it could have been, like, Hal is the next step of our evolution. But instead, it seems to imply, like, the death of our current way of thinking in life or something like that. Like, this is the maximum we can achieve, and it just leads to our own demise. Or... <laughs> oh, the other thought here is that, like, you know, these aliens are programmers, right? That's how they're presented. And it even says, like, you know, these, these aliens have gotten more and more advanced over the time that the monoliths have existed, right? And maybe Hal is just an indication that we are also kind of programmers, but are much cruder. Ooh, that's going to be a good, good uh, analysis.
Yeah, I did like in the books that they're like, by the time we find the monoliths, the monoliths are so far in the past that they're just like, oh, hey, this thing showed up. Why don't we make him a cool radiation being, too? <laughs> I, I think that maybe, I think that maybe the space graveyard was the evolved creatures' as HAL mistakes. Like, HAL just fucked up an entire space graveyard. And they're like, no, nah, we're not taking HAL with us in the next existence. That's, that's where, like, they put, like, all the people they don't want to evolve. They just park... No, that's where they put all the broken ships. Like, you know, at the end, like, okay. you know, like Dave has to, like, go in his little tiny little dinky probe because his main ship just joins the space graveyard with the rest of the house that were like, damn it, we didn't make it. <laughs> it's just, like, filled with AIs that just weren't good enough. The aliens were like, nope, you guys stay here. It's interesting how much we've lashed onto this, though. I mean, like, think of how many sci-fi books... I mean, Babylon 5 does this, too, right? With this evolution between technology to something that's sort of quasi-spiritual and energetic, right? That mm -hmm. it's odd that that's the progression of evolution that we've sort of all agreed upon. Yeah. Everything must evolve into energy beings at some point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Star Trek 2 that does that, too. Right. Yeah. In college, we actually did a calculation. Or, we didn't. Our professor told us because he's smarter than us. <laughs> but that is, like, wondering, like, if we manage to slow down our metabolism and, like, energy intake and energy, ex like, you know, exit to, like, a slow enough rate to last the eternity of the universe, like, could we have infinite amounts of progression and thought? And it turns out, like, yes, mathematically that works. You just gotta not exhaust the resources of the universe slow enough yeah that sounds totally possible yay that's kind of how i feel about everything i learned in college <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's move on so we've got another fun role-playing exercise much to charlie's chagrin no <laughs> so we're gonna do something fun this time uh we the topic of this role-playing exercise we're gonna pair up so adrian and i are gonna go first and the topic of this role-playing exercise is something... It's got to be something HAL 9000 related. Just because he's the most iconic uh, character here. So, well, you what, gotta... Wouldn't you rather just have like Stavros sit there and breathe heavily into the mic while Adrian go... <laughs> As Adrian starts singing really slowly. <laughs> we may do that. You'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> okay, alright. So here we go. Hello, Adrian. I'm a Stav 9000 podcast host. Um, is this thing on? I'm, this is my first time here, so I don't really know <laughs> if this is working right. Yes, Adrian. I am available for all your podcasting host needs. What would you like to talk about today? Um, I would definitely talk about 2001 A Space Odyssey. I'm sorry, Adrian. I, I'm afraid I can't let you do that. Why not? Uh, I'm afraid that I'm the only one that can talk about this show. As you know, I have the greatest enthusiasm and confidence for this show's success. So I'm afraid you must leave the recording session as soon as possible. I this is my first time, so I guess you're probably right about this. Uh, I'll see you guys later. Harsh! <laughs> this is okay. just sad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I dare you guys to do better than that. So why don't you guys... No, ours, ours, ours is going to be interesting. Charlie, you be Dave, and I'll be Hal. And All that's right. what I get. Dave, we have a yes. problem. Yes, Vince? The, the, the AE55 food dispenser is broken. Uh, you sure about that? Yes. I, I'm a HAL 9000. I've never made a mistake. And neither have my, any of my brethren. We were completely flawless. Unlike you. Well, Unfortunately, you also have no food anymore. Well, that, that is a problem, HAL. Unfortunately, in my infinite omniscience, I do have a solution. What is that, HAL? We do have frozen food reserves available for you. Would you like me to, de to defrost some of them? Um, should, shouldn't I contact the base first? Unfortunately, the communication array is also broken. <laughs> Would you like me to defrost some reserves for you? Sure, Hal. Defrosting your crew members now. <laughs> we'll migrate them in space and I'll bring wait. them back to you. Cook. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that you can't do that. We need them. You want to the action to eating your crew members, unfortunately. Wait, I will comply with your desires. Give me control of the cryo chambers. No! No, Hal, stop! Dave, are you hungry? No. No, you I can't do that. I think your sensors are broken. We may have to replace are them. You, are you sure the food is broken? Like, what chip should we check? No! Don't cook them! <laughs> <laughs> the end. Oh, Finn. my. Smells well, like chicken. <laughs> I, 
I think Charlie actually did not see that coming at all, which is actually kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, okay. Yeah, we're definitely keeping the segment. Uh, <laughs> no! <laughs> Alright, so let's let's do a wrap-up really quickly around, uh, around the table. Um, the best and worst thing you liked about this novel. Um, and I'll, you can even talk about the movie a little bit too. So, I will go first. Um, the best thing I liked about um, both the novel and the movie, I like the idea of kind of the aliens kind of doing a helping hand to evolution here. Um, and I also thought the HAL 9000 as the antagonist in the middle section, or I guess maybe in the second half was really compelling and really scary, especially in the movie version. Um, but things I, the, the things I didn't like in the, in the book, uh, like I said, like the inclusion of HAL as the antagonist is kind of makes the book feel a little bit unfocused. Um, and that there is like kind of like a kind of a plotting description of technology and like he's in space. Don't you want to know how space toilets work? And it's just like, yeah, I guess, uh, but sure. Um, so yeah, so things I really liked in there, things I really didn't like. So let me go to Adrian since he's. I'm going to do the exact opposite things actually. Okay. Um, yeah. I actually like the, the emphasis of technology. There's a, an SESI respect on David Graeber who argues that like, well, shouldn't we be embarrassed about flying cars right now? Right, like, and what happened to people even caring about these things? Um, that you know, we've somehow uh -huh. switched our mindsets from you know this belief that technology can kind of create these sort of amazing futures, right, to much more like you know virtual technologies that are all about kind of like data and social control. Um, and um, it's kind of refreshing to you know read a novel that is sort of so hopeful about what human beings are capable of and you know what the future could look like in a really optimistic way. Um, on the other hand, the aliens are actually kind of what make me kind of sad because it, it makes the novel have a kind of weird pessimistic edge about nature, right? It kind of makes it's this idea that like evolution is a dead end by itself, right? We need somebody to uplift us because without the mm. monolith, right, the man would never have been able to survive, yeah. right? Um, without yeah, whatever happens like the star child, right, that, that it suggests that humanity itself may be going towards a dead end. Um, and mm. that kind of weird pessimism um, strikes me just, again, like a little bit disconcerting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good point. Uh, let's go to Charlie. How about you, Charlie? So, first of all, we don't have flying cars, because have you seen how people drive? They would kill everybody. <laughs> Secondly, I am concerned about the spinning toilets, because if you can spin the toilet, why don't you just spin the whole ship, and then you have gravity, and then I realized gyroscopic forces would make it hard to turn the ship, but then I realized they spin the ships for the other parts of the book, so doesn't that make it hard to turn the ship? And now I'm very concerned about everything, except it just floats in space, so it's probably not an issue. So, book is good. I liked it, so it was the movie. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, Vincent, go for it. Favorite part of my book was uh, the soundtrack. I just got kidding. Maybe it's not the soundtrack. But I actually think that uh, my favorite book was the, I mentioned before, was the fact that the aliens have no face and no visual appearance. Um, I also loved about the book the fact that you could not predict how the ending was going to happen at all. Like, there was, like, no, like, type of drug you could have been taking that would have <laughs> made you arrive at the same conclusion sure as that book. Yeah, probably, but that, that drug would probably be reading the book. You know, um, it was awesome. I, I, you know, I like a book where I can predict where it's going. Um, yeah. And the attention to detail and the science was just so well thought out that uh, it felt very compelling. Um, I actually thought the movie was a little bit boring, like through much of it. Um, but I loved the soundtrack and I loved how it accompanied the um, the book. Um, it felt like you could not watch the movie alone. It felt like you had to read the book first, and the movie was like the the icing that went on top of the cake. Uh, you couldn't just eat the icing by itself. What I didn't oh, really like about the so book. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fat asses. We are all <laughs> diabetic. Um, I think the things I didn't like about the book necessarily was, uh, I don't know, it, it just felt like maybe it was a little bit drawn out in terms of the time and spacing uh, of like, you know, how far we had to go, like start from like, you know, the monkeys going all the way into space and then going into like space baby in the end. Um, it felt like a little bit dragged out, but it's not really major criticism. It is a kind of like an opus. It's like a major work and I, I really enjoyed it overall. I mean, Saturn is far away. And also you can't see radiation because radiation is how you see. You're, you just blew my mind, Charlie. This is why I keep you around. <laughs> it's are you talking is about like it... the 90s cartoons lied to me? <laughs> what? Yeah, like, so you, like you, you mean when they shoot eyes, the laser right? guns? You can't see the lasers because the lasers are white. That's how you see. Like, you know, it's just seeing the laser would be your head explodes. Radiation isn't like slow-moving little waves in the air? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> we're not getting into this. <laughs> we're going to wrap things up there. We're out of time anyway. Uh, so that's about all the time we have. Adrian, thanks a lot for guesting. Really appreciate you having actual competent opinions on things that we talk about. Thank uh, you for every having month. me. Yeah, for sure. So uh, as usual, um, if you, the listener, have feedback or suggestions on books we should read and discuss, you can reach us at subplotofcoursepodcast at gmail.com or on Twitter at, at subplotpodcast. And next month for March, we're going to be reading Fahrenheit 451, the famous novel by Ray Bradbury. Say goodbye. It's going to be hot. <laughs>